Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Spilling the Beans. Today, I'm sitting down for part two with my buddy Matt Skinner, who owns High Rise Beverage Company. And last week, we talked a lot about the product itself, which is a hemp-infused uh, CBD and THC beverage, and uh, the impact that it's making and, and the reverberations that it's making in a good way in the industry, and, um, and how, how, it's, how they've taken a big health um, angle on it, which has been dramatic for a lot of people and, and kind of move towards that NA, the non-alcoholic movement that's happening right now and how they're, how they're, you know, riding the wave of THC and hemp derived products being released across the country. And so today we're going to sit down and talk more about the business element, the business aspect of how he's been able to scale his business, how he's been able to raise money, how he's been able to get distribution nationwide and what that looks like over the next five to 10 years. So let's go sit down with Matt and learn a little bit more about the business angle of High Rise. So we are back at High Rise and I'm with my buddy Matt Skinner here. If you guys haven't seen part one of this series, go back to last week and watch part one all about the High Rise product. In fact, this is typically spilling the beans and so we're usually drinking coffee, but today we're gonna put these away and we're gonna bring out a High Rise beverage. Boom. And, and so these are the CBD ones. It's early in the morning, so we're not gonna break out the Delta 9s quite yet. Um, but I got, I got blackberry. What Grape, are you drinking? Grapefruit. Grapefruit? Grape. Cheers, buddy. Cheers. All right. All right. So in this part two, I want to talk about the business aspect, right? Like you've been out, like we've been in a couple of different masterminds together. Uh, you've been out to the Legacy Summit. And I know a little bit about this, the story. I know about, you know, bringing on investors. I know about the, the regulatory uh, struggles and, and swimming upstream that you've had to deal with. Um, I'm familiar. I'm sure that there's been other bottlenecks in distribution and getting into all these expansion into different states and all those kinds. I think it's really really cool. And I want to talk about the the retail locations that you've built and the dry bars as well because there's so many different business elements and lessons to be learned around, around this journey. So first off, give me your background so that way everybody understands. What your entrepreneurial background? Like, how did you become a business owner and entrepreneur? So, you know, I've always just kind of had that spirit. I uh, moved out west when I was 20 years old. And, I, you know, didn't have a lot to me at that point. Just kind of wanted to travel out there. Always loved this industry. So moved up to Humboldt County, which if everybody knows anything about Humboldt County, that's where uh, Cannabis Mecca is from. Um, Murder Mountain, that docu-series. Was that is Colorado? Incredible. No, that's up in California, oh, Northern California, California, Northern California. So anyway, I've just really loved this industry. But anyway, it was just, you know, the THC world at that time. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, I moved down to Chico, California, which is about an hour south of Northern California up in Humboldt and got in a little pizzeria and I met the owner. He was a younger guy. Um, he had followed his passion, followed his dream, started as a delivery driver for him and he actually kind of took me under his wing and he showed me all aspects of the business. And it was just a small pizzeria, but it was a college focused town. It was a cool place to be um, at that time in my life. Um, I was just enjoying that environment and I ended up falling in love with it and started dating a young lady and her father saw how hard I was working and he knew that I was wanting to eventually move and do something on my own. And he invested in me and we opened up our own pizzeria. And I start, opened a brand called Left Coast Pizza very early 20s at that time. Um, won Best Pizzeria its first year. Wow. And I had my whole, the whole little high school around the corner. All those kids worked there at the pizzeria. And it was something that, it was the only time in my life that, that I'd ever found something that I was every day I woke up for the passion of it. It mm -hmm. wasn't ever about a dollar bill. It was about a passion. I loved that I created something. Um, ended up selling that, uh, coming back to South Carolina. Really lost that, that passion. You know, I, I couldn't find it in anything I did. And then, again, um, my wife, you know, suffering from ulcerative colitis. When this whole farm bill happened, we found out up in Ashburn. Explain, explain the farm bill. What is that? So the farm bill is where they came out and basically said that hemp, and really the point of it was from an industrial standpoint. It really didn't. We weren't thinking at that point about CBD shops or anything like that. But the way it was written... Um, it allowed for CBD tinctures 
And what a tincture is, it's like a liquid that you put under your, under, under your tongue um, to help you just relax. Um, and different products that are CBD gummies, um, things just to relax you started coming. And as we started diving deeper- Are these all that, medical use or was it recreational also? Just medical. Okay. Okay. Um, but so you, you need a you need a prescription from a, from a doctor. No, you don't. You, you don't. And that's the thing. When they wrote the farm bill, it got away from regulatory states like California, Colorado, where you know you'd go into dispensaries. This is something that was just a farm bill. Like I said, it was only for industrial. Mm -hmm. But as we started grabbing a hold of what that actual farm bill says, it allowed products with 0.3 percent or less THC, anything a derivative from that hemp plant can be into a product. So, you know, when like I, like I said on the last series, we started making products that carried more weight. So would you, would you say that that's kind of like, my mom always used to talk about like three, two beer when she was in college. It's just like a less amount of alcohol in a beer. That's similar to what it this is. was. It's just a, it's a micro dose. It is right? a micro dose. So explain what a micro dose is. So a micro dose is just a version of so anything you can have, a microdose is just a very, very small effects version of anything. Mm -hmm. So a microdose and- You, you see the buzz on, on mushrooms, on THC and stuff about microdosing. It's, yep. And, and kind of, we were talking offline, but it's like people don't come in here and they don't drink high rise in order to get high, right? They don't, they don't drink it in order to like, you know, uh, not be in control. It's a health focused beverage. Yep. And Microdosing is very health focused overall. It, it right? is, it is. And I'm sure some people drink them to get high. I mean, we know that there's, drink a lot of them, right? there, there's that audience out there. And you know, if you drink enough of them, you'll definitely find yourself in a really, really high state. But the purpose of our drinks were just really for a microdose that, like I said in the last session, to substitute a glass or two of wine. But, um, and that's what a microdose is. A, anything, a dosing of anything, you can abuse it. You know, we really, you really- Too much honey, dude. Yeah, we, know, like we, we limit the milligrams on our cannabinoids and products that we make. So when people have something, because a lot of people are interested, they're kind of curious. They've always been told their whole life not to touch this space. It's devil's lettuce, whatever you might've heard. Um, and all you got to do is have one episode where you get too high, you get paranoia kicks in, um, or you just, you know, and we keep referring back to mushrooms or you eat too many mushrooms and you start seeing 15 galaxies at the same time. You know, we're at a place where we just want you to find a nice comfort, really get rid of that stress, still be in a very social setting, mm -hmm. have conversation like this. And if you dose rightly, that's what microdosing does. Microdosing brings you back to just a level of comfort. Mm -hmm. um, so when you are dosing anything, you'll find your own microdose. Find that place where you have something that takes the edge off, just like a glass of wine, but you're not putting something so negative in your body. You're not right. putting alcohol in your body. So, yeah. No, I love it, man. You move from California, you come back to South Carolina, your wife is suffering from an autoimmune disease, and, uh, and they pass the farm bill. Yep. So where, how do you see that as an opportunity? Like, where's the opportunity there, and why so, did you see it? So you? me and Libis, we, we've known each other our whole life. People that really know our story, we've got a, picture when I was 10 and she was eight, I actually kissed on my grandma's front porch step. Oh man. I never knew that she suffered from this. I don't think it's something that anybody feels comfortable sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a very touchy subject. Uh, there's bathroom issues that come with that and that's not something anybody feels comfortable talking about. You know, it took our latter part of life when she started suffering from a lot of pain in her stomach. Um, once I got back here, for us to realize we needed to go to a doctor and take a look at what was going on. And at that time, that's when we realized how serious this was. And she found out that she was gonna be prescribed to steroids her whole life. And not only was it gonna kill her mentally and probably put some extra pounds on, uh, put hair in places that she didn't want from being on steroids, you know what I mean? We know some of the side effects that come with that, mm -hmm. but it was also a financial crazy, crazy, hit on us. Um, she wanted to find an alternative. She's always been passionate about cannabis. And I think part of the reason she has been is because there has been a sense of comfort that's given her body mm -hmm. that a lot of people can't understand because a lot of, other, all of us all have been using it more from a social experience standpoint. And she never shared that with me. And um, once we found that out, 
um, and the farm bill, you know, once that took place, we heard up in Asheville, North Carolina, that they were opening these CBD dispensaries, a lot like what you'd see out West. We all know Asheville is so progressive. Mm -hmm. So we actually did a trip up there and uh, we're just kind of checking it out and realize that there was a lot of companies up there that weren't only opening CBD shops, they had farms up in that beautiful place of Asheville, North Carolina, mm -hmm. and they were like growing their own hemp. and. Um, they were taking little manufacturing facilities and really starting to make their own products. And we were just fascinated by it. So was this done on a state by state basis or was the farm bill a federal? Farm bill is federal. Okay. So for, yeah, exactly. So farm bill is a federal, um, 2018, it came out, um, you know, and it would be, which then allowed the states to start passing it as well. Correct. And it'll, it, it allowed these products as long as it's derived from the hemp plant that have more than 0.3% or less THC, all these derivatives from it. And then, you know, and again, not to get really off topic, but the big thing at first was Delta-8, because Delta-8 was a derivative that we had really never explored in the THC side of marijuana, because you, you've got that side, but it was something that we could almost exploit because it's a derivative from the hemp plant. Um, and that was the first thing to hit the market that had a psychoactive effect to it. We didn't really pay a lot of attention at first to the Delta-9 side of things because we knew that that was your true THC, which is what, what Delta-9 is. What's the difference between Delta-8 and Delta-9? From an effect standpoint, the difference between Delta-8 and Delta-9, Delta-8 is, it's more of a relaxing cannabinoid. A lot of people use it for pain and inflammation. It definitely focuses on that side of things. There's a lot of great benefits of Delta-8. Um, Delta-9 is more of your stimulant um, from a high standpoint. It's a little more you know, I would say abrasive from an effect standpoint. That's it doesn't make you want to go to sleep. It doesn't make you want to go to sleep. Delta right. 8 does. Delta 8, and, and again, everything's in dosing. Again, it's you can do a little bit of Delta 8. It might just give you that extra little pep in your step, but Delta 8's known as a cannabinoid that will help you relax at night, help you sleep better, um, and it will also really help with pain and inflammation. We have you know, MUSC right around the corner from our store downtown, mm -hmm. and patients that go over there who are looking for treatment and looking for something different than an opioid, sometimes we'll, we'll, they'll get referred down to us. And sometimes it's for a Delta 8 product. I will say there's very new research on Delta 8, and so it hasn't been around as long. And I think that that's where, you know, you start getting into some long-term concerns of it. South Carolina's taking a stance that Delta 8 in this state, they view it as illegal because it's not completely clarified. Um, in the hemp bill, even though it's a derivative of the hemp plant. Um, Delta 9, on the other hand, is completely clarified in the hemp bill. And that's what it says in the, in the, in the when I keep saying the hemp bill, the farm bill. In the farm bill, it says 0.3% or less um, Delta 9 by dry weight. Mm. And so it uses the term Delta 9. So that's why we know that that cannabinoid is something that we can really work with. Interesting. And so we'll talk to Libis, but I know she started the Charleston Hemp Collective because of the, the health components of, yep. of how this has positively affected her and her situation. And then you see an opportunity to essentially take it into a beverage side. Like what, what spurred that and what has that process been like? So as we started to, so when we, let me step back for a minute. When we opened our first store downtown and then we knew we were gonna expand into a location in Savannah, then open one in Columbia, and then eventually open one up in a little shop up in Boone, um, we knew that we needed to really get behind our products in a different level, meaning that we needed to manufacture every single one of them. Um, we started working with a group out of Boone, North Carolina, where we worked with them to craft these specific products for the Charleston Hemp Collective brand. Um, those guys up there cut their teeth from the hops industry and they own that manufacturing facility. They really got into the extraction side of hemp once the farm bill came out. Um, and they actually suggested to us that we need to bring a a <clears throat> drink into our Rolodex of products with Charleston mm -hmm. Hemp Collective. And as we thought about it, at first I was like, I just don't think that the drinks are gonna go over. I, I just don't, I really did think, I was like, I don't know. I just don't see people wanting to drink it. Um, and then the, we started doing some research on what was going on on the West Coast and these THC brands that were out there in the beverage were really, really doing well. Mm -hmm. Gwyneth Paltrow invested in a brand called Can. Um, and we were starting to see some, I was like, well, maybe there's a little more teeth to this than we thought. Then after we saw what was going on with a couple of brands, we were like, maybe we don't want to call this Charleston Hemp Collective. This might have bigger legs than the Southeast. We, mm -hmm. this might be something that we actually can put throughout the nation through distributors. And we came up with high rise and, um, I love well, the name though. 
Yeah, I, it's been, I tell you what, Stephanie Zupak, she is our marketing director. She's helped craft our brand. She's been on this mission with me and Libis from when we day. It was just the two of us and we were looking for somebody to help us put labels on our Charleston Hemp Collective. And she's helped us create all this. And she really knocked it out the park with this. Right, she's uh, done a fantastic job. <clears throat> and, and I think the logos are great. I think the, uh, the branding overall has been, I mean, it's, it's, it's why you guys get, get all these awards and get nominated for all these awards. Well, you know, for, I mean, for best brand. One thing that's different with it when it comes to the branding. You got a great packaging. Well, you got a great product, but the packaging is, is very important it, too. It, right? it is important. And, and, and marketing is very important. And people feel uncomfortable who aren't in the world of cannabis picking up something that they can be around their children or at a social event and not look like they're drinking something that's got pot leaves on. And there's nothing wrong with it. There's an audience for everything. Again, I say that because that's just not the route we took. I, I think we really kind of felt confident that we were going to try to put something into on-premise accounts, which when I say on-premise accounts, I'm talking about restaurants. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the other brands that are in this marketplace really were like, okay, let's put something in bottle shops, let's put something in CBD stores. So they were looking at an audience like that to take home and sit at home and maybe sit on the couch or be with their friends. But we wanted to really normalize this, which we've been fortunate that actually worked for us. So our branding was something that could really, really look like it was just a universal drink, not something mm -hmm. that was stonerish. Right, Does that right. Make sense? Absolutely, right. It looks like a seltzer. It looks like you're just getting a seltzer at, at a restaurant or at a bar, um, as opposed to getting a beer or getting something else. And so I think the branding has been on point. The product obviously is on point. And you guys have gone through a lot of uh, growth, and I'm sure there's growing pains that comes with that, right? And so let's talk a little bit about that because you've opened up and, and you're in, uh, really there's, there's two, two components that I want to hit on. One of which is the physical locations, right? And the dry bars that you eventually started opening up. And two is the distribution into all the different states. Uh, which one are you going to start with? Let, let's talk about distribution. Let's talk about distribution. So let's dive into distribution first. And there's also, you know, I mean, again, we might not talk about it, but the, the you know, the raising of capital for something well, like this is something I've never experienced in that, my life. That's part of all of it, right? Okay, yeah. That, that kind of is behind <clears throat> the scenes and funds all this stuff. But... Let's talk about the distribution. So you guys are actually manufactured up in North Carolina. We, we were manufacturing in North Carolina. We now manufacture with our growth. We manufacture down in Florida. We manufacture in Tennessee. And uh, we will be manufacturing um, up in Northern California as okay. well right now. Because we're, we're distribution nationwide. And that then helps with distribution. Correct. To, to, yeah. For logistics. Yeah. The, yeah. the whatever. Mid-Atlantic, the Southeast, and then out West. Uh, it makes a lot of sense, and it makes sense that as you know, what got you here isn't going to get you to the next point. And there's adjustments and there's changes that need to be made in business all the time, and that's that's one of them. That makes a lot of sense. So, what does it look like from getting into all these different states? Does each state now need to pass certain regulatory laws? Like I know Ohio was a medical marijuana state, and it just passed as a recreational marijuana state. Um, in, and in the most recent November election in, in November of 23. Does each state need to get there in order for you guys to distribute high rise? They do, and not necessarily, I mean the Farm Bill pretty much states that, like I said, the Delta 9 and all states, um, except for a couple that actually have regulated THC, they've um, openly kind of banned uh, these hemp products. Um, but because just, the, the feds can say this, but the state can override it if they choose. To. And, and the state, you know, you got to put a bill in. You got to kind of go through the regulatory steps for that. But it's so new and it's on such a rise so fast. And I think that that's what High Rise, along with so many other great brands in the market right now that are coming into this space, are trying to do. It is a definitely a prohibition place. I mean, just what we've gone through <clears throat> here in South Carolina. We're now state by state dealing with some form of challenge with every state. And most of the time it's label restrictions. Mm -hmm. So like we're having to modify cans for what the labels need to have on them because each state feels a little comfortable with something. And we're trying to find a universal label where we can apply this, apply this, apply this, yeah. and eventually. But it, those are the challenges. And um, that's one of the big challenges yeah. for sure. So how many states are you guys in right now? So we are... Currently in Texas, we just finalized a statewide contract in Texas, North Carolina, South Carolina, 
Um, we're launching in Florida in two weeks, so we'll be statewide in Florida as well. We've done a lot of growth over the last 30 days. Um, Boston, Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island, Chicago, we're finalizing a partnership right now as well. Um, and I'm hoping, if you boys are listening, that we're finalizing a partnership in LA and San Diego. Mm. Um, so we've done a lot of growth. I mean, when you look at that, um, and now the great thing, the big thing is, is, you know, we were very limited with distributors wanting to be involved with this industry. We're starting to see some of the big boys come out now. Is, is they that, realize it's here to stay. That, that's what I was going to ask. How are you even expanding? Do you just find a local partner who is a, distrib a distribution company for alcohol and just any, any other beverage company as well? And you, you link arms with them and then they essentially become your sales force. Correct. So we've spent a year and a half in this market building this market and, you know, knocking on the doors of um, the Budweiser's of the world. They just, they couldn't touch it for a while. I, I feel confident in saying, and if not, you'll have to edit this, but today we finalize our contract with Southern Crown, which is Budweiser of South Carolina and Budweiser of Georgia, biggest distributor in the market, really does a great job. And we're honored to have an opportunity to partner with them. And I know that they've talked to us through the last year, watching our development and they're just making sure all the ducks are in a row with compliance in South Carolina, but they are dropping our adaptogens line of high rise and they will be hopefully selling our cannabinoid version as well once we get our compliance through Georgia mm -hmm. and through South Carolina. I mean, that's, that's exciting. And so this is, a, this is a distributor. They don't own Budweiser, but they distribute Budweiser. They distribute, and, they, and, they, and they control the distribution in South Carolina and, and Georgia. And then I'm sure that they distribute other beverages, obviously including the high rise beverages. So this is somebody who can get you into all the different restaurants, all the different retailers. They're in everyone already. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. And so all this is, is they're looking for another way to make more money on their existing customers, right? In order to offer them a new product. Right. And it gets you the distribution arm with someone who is already involved, right? Now all of a sudden you are in every restaurant, every retail shop across these couple of states that they that they operate in. Correct. And the nice thing about them is they are a bud network. So, you know, the ownership here they make are, an introduction to another state. They they do. And they're they're already kind of helping with some of that. You know, of course they're gonna take a conservative approach. Um, but it's exciting to be getting in that network. Uh, you know, they've done such a great job of distribution for so many years and um, you know, like I said, it's an honor to start working with them. That's awesome, man. And so uh, uh, can we talk in, in like percentages? You don't have to say like dollars or anything, but like, what does that look like? I don't even understand. Like, all right, let's say you make this and it costs a dollar to make. How much does everybody get across the board? Is that, is so that yeah, yeah, you're looking, or yeah, is that, no, like, it is. No. They, you got your standard margins and distribution and all this not coming from beverage. It's been like, we're just trying to keep up and learn this all the time. Yeah. So, you know, your distributors are looking for around a 30% margin. Okay. Um, they want 30% of the retail price? They want 30, Is that typical? Yeah, they want 30%. So there's, you sell to them as a wholesale, mm -hmm. okay? Then they have a 30% margin before it goes to retail. So and you're actually re selling to the distributor. You sell to the distributor. Okay, and then so distrib they're buying X number of products. Correct. And then they're guaranteeing they, that they're gonna put it in a certain number and then of they, And then they put it into the marketplace and then they have, and then the, the, the retailer usually was looking for about a 40% margin okay. before they price it on the shelf. Okay, so if, if... Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So let's let's make up some numbers. If you're selling this to the distributor for $1.50 a piece, they typically want... So if you're selling it to them $1.50... They, they want to sell it for $2. $2. That's about a 25%. Well, that's about a 25%. Yeah, so a little bit more, $2.10, yeah. right? So they're gonna sell it for $2.10 and then the retailer is gonna end up selling it for like $4, because that gets them there on like 20% margin. Correct. Got it. And, and uh, that's fascinating, man. That's super, it's super interesting, just because I'm, I'm not from the product-based businesses um, or, or anything along those lines. I've always done either consulting services or something along those lines, or obviously real estate. So the product industry and the distribution of that has always been something that's interesting. It, and it is, and you always, I always heard, you know, that, that it's pennies in this game. and. You know, when you come from just a different world of real estate or something, you're like, what is pennies? How do we really even want to get caught up in that? But it is a very much a penny game. You want to get to scaling your product to a co-packer or manufacturer that you're doing, you know, 
200,000 of each one of these cans. Because once we, once we go to that level, we do a whole different level of can. Um, and we're able to get our can cost down 10 cent, but those little pennies here and there make up massive amounts when you talk about that level of volume. Well, it's, it's, it's volume. And I, I remember a quote where it says, if you wanna dine with the masses, cater to the classes. If you wanna dine with the classes, cater to the masses. And so what that means is like, if you wanna, uh, in, in the, the very expensive products that only cater to the rich people, right? Eh, you're not gonna make that much money. But if you can be a Walmart that caters to the masses, that's why they have an entire, uh, I mean, you're talking about generational wealth, cousins and brothers and sisters, and it, like they're all the wealthiest people in the entire world because they cater to the masses, right? And something like this, if you can get the distribution, those pennies start multiplying, compounding, and all of a sudden turn into, we're catering to the masses, dine with the class, it becomes a very profitable business then. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we've been, you talk about the business, we have been very lucky. I, I have been fortunate, number one, to evolve a team that we, we had a gentleman come to us, his name is David Perry, when we were just doing a little expo a year and a half ago, um, a hemp expo, we dropped high rise right then. We still had the stickers on the cans and uh, he was working as a consultant, as a COO for another company that was already in the cannabis space. And we met, he came a little bit from owning his own beverage, fell in love with this moment he tasted it. And uh, we just built a relationship and he ended up coming on board with me at the beginning as a COO. So mm -hmm. he's helped us quickly formulate a strong, strong team. Um, the other thing is, you know, going back to the masterminds group, you know, being a part of that with you here in Charleston and Gunnar inviting me to that, it, it kind of opened me up to some of the, some of my strengths, but also a lot of my weaknesses. And scaling a company like this, I've never been a part of anything like it before. I'm just really, really lucky with this brand that we put ourselves around great people. Our other thing that we've done that you don't know about is we, we launched in Nashville and we did so well with Lipman, who was our distributor up there, that they made an introduction um, to us to a group called CMC. And they're a nationwide sales agency who all come from the beverage business, have 20 years worth of history, and they vet brands, and they launch brands nationwide. But when they take a brand to a distributor, that distributor knows, okay, they've already gone through 30 other brands in this category, mm -hmm. and they picked one. Right. And they, they, we are the first cannabis brand that they've launched. So all wow. the bud houses and people like that will look at us because they're like, okay, CMC's bringing this to us. They found first in class. and. Uh, that's why our expansions happen so quickly through distribution as well. But it's all about surrounding yourself with the right people. That's mm -hmm. all I'm saying. Matt, I think, I think one of your greatest strengths is you're aware enough to surround yourself with great people. Like over and over and over and over again, I see these amazing relationships that you've built um, with really, really good people. You've attracted very good people into uh, your business, into your social network, into your clientele, right? And it's because you're a good person, right? Like, like you actually care, you want to go and, and make an impact and make a difference in people's lives. And it, it shows, right? And that resonates with the people who want to work with you, the people who want to invest with you, the people who want to uh, buy your product, the people who want to partner with you on different things. Um, and it's just, it's it goes to the point of like, your luck, right, is created by the people you surround yourself with, right? It's not, it's not even the choices you make, because the choices you make are influenced by the people that you surround yourself with. And you're able to make really good choices because you've attracted an amazing COO, right? You've attracted an amazing team. You've attracted great investors that then don't only care about the dollar investment, but they're, they're making intellectual investments and business advisory investments into what you've done. And, and you're able to create this fantastic network by putting yourself in the right room, surround yourself with the right people. And I think that is a, a secret sauce that is not talked about enough. It, you know, I, that's one space that I've never talked about, that I was actually on the phone with Gunnar last night and <clears throat> He was like, I got some feedback for you. And it was from the investors. And I'm like, I, I was like, you know, Gunnar, I'm, I'm starting to get a little anxiety because you always got feedback. It makes me almost wonder, you know, are, are people questioning whether or not I'm doing a good job? He was like, I, I think the reason I like to get with you face to face is because I want to articulate this the right way. 
He goes, people just love this brand so much mm -hmm. and they see what you're on right now and they want to all bring their talents to the table for you. And <clears throat> when I talked to the chair of our board, who is Rob Sanders, he said he's never seen this in any investor group he's ever been a part of where he's raised money. He goes, it's such a group that cares so much about this brand that they're willing to go so above and beyond, um, even if it doesn't, even if there's no beneficial gain to them financially in that act of work. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it just it blows me away. But you know, all of this investor group that's part of the masterminds group that came in that initial group. They all, you know how talented all of them are yeah. in, in their own respects in every way. And they all have come to the table and want to just help this brand grow up. Well, so I mean, there, it's, it's become sort of a movement, you know? It's this health movement um, and non-alcoholic movement that uh, they truly believe in. And they see how it's impacted their own lives, seeing how they, it's impacted their own social um, aspect of their lives. And uh, there's so much buy-in behind that and behind you and behind... Uh, the product and the team that I think there's, there's, you know, it's great to have everybody linking arms and running it's, in the same direction, man. It's, it's awesome. All right, so so I want to pivot a little bit, okay? Because distribution, man, it seems like distribution is going up and to the right nonstop. And I was told, what's well, it been about a year that you had the dry bar open? Right at a year. Yeah. Right at a year. And I remember, um, I don't know if it was Gunner or if it might have been Caleb, and they mentioned that. Hey, Matt's opening up a dry bar, right? And I was like, this is a horrible idea. I don't know why he would want to take the time to do that. He'd take on the additional overhead of doing that. It's constrained by how many people you can have in this area in any given day, right? Like it's not infinitely scalable, like all of the distribution, right? The, the distribution is very little overhead comparatively. It's infinitely scalable and it has the ability to uh, really grow your bottom line far greater than having a dry bar. So explain to me, why do we have a cannabis dry bar? Well, you know, the, first of all, it's an, it was originally an extension of the Charleston Hemp Collective storefronts. So, so it's something that's like, like, again, I had limited information. I thought that you were opening up a new location just for the dry bar. It's yeah. already just, it's an extension of what you're already doing on the cannabis. It the was, cannabis but as we started, well, that's what originally the thought process was, but the more and more we thought about it, there were so many key pieces that made this dry bar relevant. And first of all, it creates for our storefront a whole nother audience to walk through our storefront. Agreed. They're gonna sit down here, they're gonna have an experience with cannabis, they're gonna catch a little bit of a buzz, and then they're gonna be like, oh, let's go walk through the store and get some stuff to take home where they mo might not ever walk in our store before. Agreed. So this store does extremely well here. It is our number one store, and this component brings a lot to that. Um, this, is the, a, this does more in revenue than the downtown on King Street, the main yeah. shopping, uh, uh, I mean, it's where everybody goes in Charleston in order to go shopping. And it does more than our Savannah store on River Street, which, River Street which is, is the, the main drag down, is main drag down there. Yeah. And that's right across from Kessler's new plant River District, which is where everybody goes now when they go down there. And yeah. all the new restaurants are popping up right there. And both those stores do really well. But this store, and you know, my partner here, Chris Long, I, I, don't, I couldn't have done it without him because I'm on the road a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm unfortunately not here as much as I want to be. But the other reason we want to do some is we've always landed our stores in those places where it's that tourist traffic. And being a Charleston brand, that has gotten so much support from our community, we wanted to do a store where the community could get to it better. Mm -hmm. And what's a better place than beside the poorhouse? You know, we're out here doing these farmer's markets every Sunday, so much love from the community around here. And we're starting to sell high rise when it first launched. And I looked at Chris, cause me and him were out there working the farmer's market. I said, listen, they're building this awesome new building next door, let's go. And then that's when we talked about the dry bar. So this was a little bit of an afterthought for the storefront. It's ended up being um, a highlight of the community. In Charleston, this cannabis dry bar was nominated for best new bar in Charleston. And we know how many amazing bars open up in Charleston. And this is a dry bar, there's no alcohol here. Best so new just, bar and it doesn't even sell it alcohol. It doesn't even sell alcohol. So just to get nominated <laughs> um, was just amazing. And it just means that the community is looking for this and their support of the brand. So I, and, I don't know. And it's always packed, right? On the weekends, you got great crowds, yeah. Um, unbelievable crowds on the weekend, standing room only, and um, 
it's a, it's a destination. I was thinking, you know, you're next to the Poor House, which is, a, you know, a very popular bar, and people would stumble over here in order to have like a nightcap or something. But that's not what you're seeing either. Yeah, I don't think they see as much of that. Um, there is some of that, of course, because just out of default. I um, mean, when we first thought about it, we thought we'd get a lot of that. You know, you really have created, and the team here, the the the, the team that works here, really puts a lot of passion. On it. It's created a safe place for people, a place where people can go and they can go out for the night and they know when they go in there, it's not going to be a bunch of drunks and nothing wrong with that. I love my alcohol, so I don't say a bunch of drunks like there's anything wrong with that. We know Charleston's built around that, but it's a place now where people can go. They can share so stories of their sobriety or they're just trying to be out for a night and they don't want somebody that's had 15 drinks reaching over their back. You know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? It's just a totally different vibe in here. And it's a great place. And for those of you who haven't been down here, you gotta come check it out. The people working here are amazing. So is that the new plan with all the different Charleston Hemp Collectives is to then integrate a dry bar into them? 100%. This is a new, and it also, there's one other element that this has brought. For people who are curious about high rise, but aren't wanting to go to the bottle shop and grab a six pack or go out to a, a restaurant and be around a bunch of people. And do, they can come here and they can really get an education from a bartender on what these drinks will do to you because the team here knows this brand better than anywhere. Yeah. And they can just really, you can, you can actually have samplings of it if you want to. You can come down here, understand the direction of why we created these drinks. Um, and you're in a safe environment. So they can have one for the first time, see how they feel amongst people who are already feeling the same way. And it's a very comforting place to try this product for the first time. So, are but each, yes, we are. Are each of your businesses, it seems like each business is kind of siloed off on its own thing, right? So right. like Charleston Hemp Collective is its own business. Correct. Is the Dry Bar its own business also? Yeah, the, the dry bar is a connection to this Charleston Hemp Collective store. So, so <clears throat> is it the same ownership group that owns both of them? It is. Okay, so the same ownership group owns both of those. And then there's the distribution on the high rise, that which the beverage company is a different company. Correct. Right, yeah. Well, I think it's, I think it's smart to kind of silo those things off because they all feed off of each other, but they are all different businesses and they all would sell at different multiples. Right, too, right? 100%. Like the, the beverage bev company could sell at whatever, the the you know depending on what the dry bar looks like and the distribution from the Charleston Hemp Collective could sell at a different multiple. Um, maybe you maintain a little bit more control. You can then sell off the the beverage company and then still keep these and still have a percentage of ownership. Like it's it's good and you can raise money differently as well. And it's it's good to have them siloed off because it's like I don't know. I, I have a I have a software business right, and so I'm developing the software. But the foundation of the software can also be used, like we're using it for property management software. It can also be used in different other industries, like a marketing industry, like a manufacturing industry. And we can use the, the foundational, uh, uh, what would you call it? Architecture, the engineering of the, of the software itself with just a few different tweaks in all these different businesses. But like each one, can be its own and we can raise money on this one, we can raise money on this one, we can sell this one or take this one public or whatever that looks like. And then same thing with the intellectual property. Intellectual property is owned in a different entity that these software companies then license and then I can set, either keep or I can sell the licensing. And I think it's good as you continue to grow and as you continue to scale to kind of silo things off from a, what does the exit strategy look like? And silo things off from, um, you know, giving up ownership or raising capital and silo things off from a liability standpoint, right? right? If one thing gets sued or something goes south, it doesn't adversely affect all these other different businesses. 100%, 100%. And they all scale differently, right? Mm -hmm. Beverage to really stay in that game and to be relevant, it, it's something I've never seen before. So the scaling aspect, when I first got into beverage, which like I said, was a little bit of an afterthought for another product just to bring into our Rolodex, um, people would say, you know, listen, you're gonna to need to raise, you know, millions, when I say millions, you know, 30, 40 million, you know, if you go nationwide to really scale this company and to have the support behind it to do it the right way. And I'm like, how in the world is it ever gonna cost that? But when you think about it, like right now, for example, like I shared with you, we're 30% of America um, population-wise we're hitting right now and um, putting sales support in every single one of those markets, that's something that, a lot of brands in our space right now, you know, because we're a lot of them are mom and pop. We've been fortunate to have great 
um, fundraising through our community and people that are a part of this brand. So we're able to capitalize and put coolers in the market and put like the old Red Bull coolers that are high rise to create that POS, um, to put salespeople in the markets to educate. And, and we're gonna continue to do that. And it, but what you realize very fast is you are spending that money. It's just a whole nother, with the retail stores, we can open one, let it sit, make some money, mm -hmm. and we can find one and do it in six months. We're now getting a lot of um, interest in the franchising aspect with this dry bar because it brings a whole nother dynamic. So um, we're gonna look at that. You know, I mean, the beverage world and, and high rise has got to stay on the forefront of focus right now. And I think the, the toughest part about you know, not bottlenecking yourself is trying to do too many things. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we've talked about taking this model and doing two in Nashville over the next 12 months, but with the way we're scaling right now with high rise, it, it just might be 12 months of working with our distributors throughout the country and, and, mm -hmm. and, and helping that develop. Well, I mean, there's, there's limitless opportunities every single day. The question becomes, what is the highest opportunity, right? What is the number one highest opportunity that, that we're facing, the best thing that we could be doing? And I mean, I mean, understanding where I'm at in the software business sounds like the distribution business in, in the same way of, or the beverage business, in the same way of like every dollar goes back into the business, right? So everybody thinks, oh, hey, Matt Skinner's crushing it because he's, he's scaling and scaling, getting in all these different states. But the reality that most people don't see is, every dollar goes back into the business, right? And you're, and you're just like trying to keep your head above water and keep the bills paid because you're reinvesting over and over and over again. And really the payday comes when you get bought or some big uh, private equity group comes in and buys a, a portion of the business or, or the entire business, or you go public or something along those lines happens. But there's a lot of skinny days, right? As, yeah. as you're growing the business. So let's close out with this. What does the next five years look like for, uh, for high rise? It's going to be exciting. Um, I hope, you know, you're going to get to a point where we, we did a little bit of hockey stick last year. We've been hockey sticking ever since we started, but the last 60 days, it's kind of been, if you can put a hockey stick straight up, I mean, we're, we're kind of on that movement. Um, we're putting strategic partnerships together right now. That Sony partnership that we aligned with about six months ago, um, we are finalizing a partnership with DraftKings right now. But do, like, what does that look like? Do, do, it seems like there's a lot of hands in the cookie jar. So when I say partnership, let me tell you what I mean by that. It's more of a distribution, revenue uh, well, share kind of thing? Basically, you know, you have an opportunity. In, and Sony came to us, which is great. We didn't go to them. We had an activation for CMAs at Nashville last year. Um, they had our product line. And they did it because they wanted an NA product. The product got behind stage with all the artists, Old Dominion, L King, um, some different artists. And uh, you know, a month went by after we did that activation. It went great. We were excited about the results and the and what people shared with us. We saw everybody drinking in the audience, and uh, we had Sony come back to us and say, "Listen, the artists absolutely love this. They're looking for an alternative to alcohol." Uh, Miller Coors is our partner on the on the um, alcohol space. We've never had an NA partner. We want to offer you an official partnership. Um, you know, there's a financial responsibility that comes with that. And then they, you know, we brand with them. We do activations with them. They support us. And again, finding those partnerships like with the Sony's of the world really normalizes this for us. And that's important. And now we're, you know, working on this DraftKings partnership that we're finalizing right now. Um, but I think when you talk about the next five years, creating more of that normalizing and, and just think, continuing yeah. to grow that way. Um, I think that's where the opportunity becomes uh, or, or comes from is like more of what's already happened here in Charleston of the health component and normalizing it. And it's not you going out and getting stoned. It's not like it's it's a it's a social way to not have to drink alcohol, still feel good, healthier way to, to get a little bit of a buzz, be social and interact with people. And the more you can normalize that, the more that, like from the last podcast, you talked about your mom who is so anti, don't be a drug dealer, right? To now being the number one proponent of, of your brand. Um, how do we convert more? Like, how do you convert more people? How do you educate more people and, and go through that process? I think that's, 
You do that, man, I think the whole thing, and it's all already trending yeah. in that direction, well, but once you get there and you guys are on the forefront of it, I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes. That's the one in the next five years. And again, I think it's gonna happen quicker than that because it's moving I'm so excited. fast now, but it's just gonna be, you know, city by city, state by state. Mm -hmm. And and it gives, me and my wife don't have kids, and you know, again, we miss that space in our life. And we, when Charleston Hemp Collective came on, we realized that the work it was gonna take to do this, we kind of were in a space where like, we got one last shot. Mm -hmm. And now we feel like everything has a purpose, right? And we get an opportunity to really go and be part of this prohibition and do it the right way and educate. and. We love where we're at. That's what we're gonna do over the next couple of years. Man, it's exciting to see just what's happened in the past two years that we've known each other and how much this has grown. Um, and I can't imagine what it looks like, right? Like a lot of the hard work, I mean, there's always gonna be hard work, right? But a lot of the hard work and getting the plane off the ground has uh, has happened and you guys are in such a good spot and you're, you're capitalizing on, it, on all the right ways. and. Um, it's great, there's always gonna be little bottlenecks and little obstacles to overcome and all those things, but you got a great team around you, great group of investors behind you, great group of, of people that are giving you insights um, and, and, and able to advise and uh, doing all the right things, man. You're putting in the work for sure. So Thank you. it's awesome to see, proud of you, bro. Thank and, you very And I much. can't wait to see what it looks like over the next few years. I appreciate you, thank you. Hey, hopefully you guys got some great takeaways. We'll share Matt's contact information in the notes, show notes below. Make sure you give him a follow. Uh, you can check out High Rise at, at their link as well. Um, if you're ever down in Charleston, you wanna check out the Dry Bar. They've done an amazing job here. Um, and it's a really, really cool movement that they've, uh, that they've made in the health industry here in the Charleston and surrounding area and now going nationwide with it. So it'll be awesome to watch Matt's journey long-term and see how this shakes out over the next three, five, 10 years. Uh, their growth has been unbelievable and I'm excited to see, again, how it plays out over time. So appreciate you being here. Give me your biggest takeaway in the comments below. If you have any questions, put that in the comments. Happy to create some content or send a video to you answering those questions as well. So appreciate you. See you next week.